Welcome everyone and happy Earth Day. Thank you for tuning in today for our virtual dialogue on climate and security. We'll get started in just a minute as we wait for everyone to join and get settled. Hello everyone, I hope you're well. Thank you for joining us for our FP virtual dialogue. Today, we're launching our FP analytics latest special report on climate and security, which focuses on the pressing and interconnected issues that climate change is presenting for the Middle East, North Africa and beyond. I'm Allison Carlson, Managing Director of FP analytics, the research and advisory division of foreign policy. Following on a series of editorial conference calls for our FP Insider subscribers, as well as FP virtual dialogues on a range of pressing topics. This week, we're excited to share with you the latest work coming out of our analytics division and join in conversation with leading experts who are working on the front line of, the, of these issues. Joining us today will be Dr. Marcus King, Associate Professor and Director of the Master's Program in International Affairs at the George Washington University's Elliott School. He previously directed studies on climate change and security at CNA's Center for Naval Analyses. And Dr. King also serves as a Senior Fellow and member of the Advisory Board at the Center for Climate and Security. He has a wealth of expertise, particularly in the fields of environmental and transnational security and his current research focuses on water stress and subnational conflict. We're also joined today by Mr. C.D. Glynn, who is the president and CEO of the U.S. African Development Foundation. Prior to joining USADF in 2016, Mr. Glenn was based in Nairobi, Kenya. He was the associate director for Africa for the Rockefeller Foundation and previously served as the White House appointee at the US Peace Corps as the first director of intergovernmental affairs and global partnerships. I am absolutely thrilled to have both of them here today for the conversation. Just a few housekeeping notes before we dive into the conversation, just to make sure that we can all interact during this session. So for those of you who are logged on via Zoom, you'll see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Click the Q&A button and a window will appear when you want to submit questions. I'd ask that you please submit your questions and comments as they come to mind. We'll definitely address as many as we can during the live session, but we may need to respond to some of them offline after the event. And then I'd like to remind everyone as well, please be sure to provide your name, organization, and your location, the country where you're coming from when you ask a question. And for those calling in by phone, you can submit your questions by email to web at foreignpolicy.com as they come to mind. Here, here too, please provide your name, organization, and country that you're joining from. Now let's get started with the program. First, before we get started, I'd like to share a few framing thoughts and highlights from our research, and then we can dive into the conversation with our distinguished guests. A quick background on the study. This research was conducted to better understand the climate and security dynamics that are affecting the region. The research was also done to inform a crisis simulation on these issues that FP produced in collaboration with our partners. More on that in a bit. But to all of us, there's great concern about the rising global temperatures and growing stress on natural resources, particularly water and agricultural productivity that are threatening global security at multiple levels. This is included, in, <clears throat> excuse me, by exacerbating resource scarcity and enabling weaponization of vital water infrastructure and contributing to regional instability 
And what we're seeing is that this is causing an increase in environmental migration. And in various circles, including the defense community, climate change is being recognized and acknowledged as a threat multiplier. And these pressures are compounding, certainly in the Middle East and North Africa, and they're being worsened by COVID-19, but they're also applicable to the rest of the world. And so what we wanted to do is really dive into the region and understand what is happening there. Because really what's happening in region is indicative and a harbinger of the types of transnational and climate related security threats that are applicable to the rest of the rest of the world. And we have a lot to learn by what's going on there, how it's impacting local populations and what can be done for better decision making and planning. So we dug in and the area of our research that we really focused on was the blue and white Nile River basins. It's an area that the IPCC has identified as being among the most vulnerable to climate change. And there in the countries that surround it, there are over 300 million people whose livelihoods depend on those basins. But those livelihoods are becoming impacted by an increasing salination of the soil from rising sea levels and chronic, excuse me, chronic droughts that are increasing um, impacts on agriculture and reducing productivity. And all of that is to say that's in the context of rising populations where people, including youth, are looking and needing jobs. And all of these pressures together are compounding what are already fragile states. And what we're seeing are these climate related threats are increasing food security issues and those are intensifying. Particularly in this region, there are significant shares of employment that are tied to agriculture. And this subsistence agriculture is already suffering from low productivity. On average, in the MENA region, about 20% of employment is tied to agriculture. And in fragile states more broadly about 40%. But in some of the countries around the region, including Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, more than half of employment is tied to agriculture. Still, the impacts from climate change and chronic droughts and other factors are reducing productivity. And as a consequence of that, MENA is still a net importer of food and particularly grains. And this vulnerability makes populations there really subject to price spikes. And while underreported, and these <clears throat> issues are getting worse, the situation definitely isn't new. Going back about a decade or so, um, the severe droughts in 2010 contributed to an agricultural collapse and price spikes, food security unrest that contributed to the Arab Spring. We really need to pay attention to these issues because they're not just isolated to the MENA region, they affect regions worldwide. World Bank, World Economic Forum, and others are projecting that global demand for water to exceed sustainable supply by 40% in the next decade. And over 4 billion people will be living in water scarce areas in the next two. And what we're seeing as the stress is intensifying is the increased politicization and weaponization of water. One really good example of that and a focal point in the region is the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Both it exemplifies the value of the resource and the growing cross-border tensions associated with it. Incredibly, about 85% of Egypt's water travels through Ethiopia, making it absolutely vital for livelihoods in Egypt, as well as for Ethiopia's economy. Its management, in fact, could enable Ethiopia to become the largest renewable, <coughs> excuse me, renewable energy producer and exporter in Africa. But with climate change, these transboundary water issues are growing and a growing source of tension. And they're worth paying attention to because as of, <clears throat> excuse me, right now, 60% of the world's transboundary river basins lack a cooperative management framework. And without governance, these critical water resources and water infrastructure are increasingly being politicized and weaponized by state and non-state actors. And what we're also seeing is that these factors are increasing instability and displacement in the region that's 
contributing to internal and outward migration. Over the last year alone, about 16 million people were displaced due to climate related factors. And that number is projected to jump more than 12 fold in the next two decades. With all of this said, there's a clear need for more strategic planning and collaborative action on climate. The pressures on the environment and the communities are clear and they're currently being com compounded by COVID-19, making addressing these interconnect interconnected and transnational risks ever more urgent. And so it's with these issues in mind that I bring us back to this simulation. Last fall, FP, in collaboration with our partners, convened a series of climate and security peace games in Abu Dhabi and in Paris. And these simulations brought together global leaders, diplomats, policy planners, experts, and several young people to address the kind of security events that could materialize from climate change. This special report that we're launching today synthesizes that research that informed the simulation and it includes recommendations for actions from the participants who joined us from around the world. I'd really like to acknowledge right now our partners and supporters in that effort, including the Paris Peace Forum, Corber Stiftung, the Emirates Diplomatic Academy and FP's founding sponsor, UAE. The details of that report can be found on our website at foreignpolicy.com slash climate and security. But for now, I'd like to focus our time learning from our distinguished experts who have a wealth of experience and expertise working in this region and on these issues. I think the challenge is clear, but I'd really like to focus now on what can be done. So I'd like to welcome our distinguished guests back to the conversation for some questions. Hello, Marcus and CD. Thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate you being here. Thanks. Happy Earth Day, Allison. Happy Earth Day to you as well. Thank you very much for the invitation and congratulations on the report. Thank you so much. And thank you for all of your contributions to it. Diving right in, um, Marcus, I'd like to ask you, in your experience in focusing on security threats to the region, what do you see having worked in this area for decades and also working on the ground? What do you see as some of the most underappreciated risks and security threats for the region that are linked to climate change and what can be done about them? Well, um, I think generally when most people think about the Middle East and North Africa in terms of climate impacts, what immediately comes to mind is droughts. And one thing about droughts um, that we've learned recently is that climate change increases the um, severity and the possibility of droughts at least two to three times. So we've seen the worst drought in instrumental record in the Mediterranean region, for example, as you alluded to in 2011, um, which was a root of the Arab Spring. Um, but I think some of the lesser known impacts um, will take a little bit longer to unfold. So for example, sea level rise has caused a problem in, um, in Egypt. So we have the fertile delta there, which has been flooded. Um, there's been saline intrusion into the delta there. Um, the city of Alexandria, and um, this might be true for the city of Alexandria, Virginia, but certainly the city of Alexandria, um, Egypt as well, um, has been flooded. They've had to move infrastructure um, a little bit further back build a little more resilience in seawalls, um, but really looking at some of the other impacts um, of water and sea level rise. And that's, um, there's a very narrow fertile agricultural zone on each side of the Nile um, that's being encroached upon by desertification. Um, so it's some of these other effects that people don't think of as, as um, readily as say temperature and drought um, that are longer range, but also very important um, to the region. Um, so speaking of solutions, um, as you asked, um, one of the main solutions is going to have to be desalinization. Um, desalinization is already put into effect um, on a small scale in some of the resort areas, for example, in Egypt, but we've got to scale it up. 
um, one thing about desalinization is it really takes a lot of energy um, to, to, to do it at scale. And so um, building a more robust um, energy infrastructure to support that, electric grids, um, these would be some very um, in, important ways forward. Um, also in Egypt, there's an initiative to, um, to, to, so to enhance the uh, ability to dig a little deeper um, to get those boreholes in these water wells further down to the aquifer um, so that water can be brought up and, and the land can be more fertile. Um, all this in an atmosphere though of water scarcity as you alluded to before. Great, thank you. And just dovetailing off what you're saying, I'd like to turn it over to CD with a question for you. And I know you through your work with USADF are working directly in communities throughout the region. Um, and I'm really curious what you're seeing in those communities, how you're seeing the climate security nexus manifesting itself and how you're seeing that impact people's livelihoods economic and physical security. And if you can pro provide some concrete examples of what you're seeing there and what you're seeing being done. Thank, thanks, Allison. Just as a quick um, primer, um, United States African Development Foundation, we're a congressionally funded uh, independent agency of the US government. And we invest directly into grassroots, small and medium-sized enterprises, grassroots entrepreneurs, African, entrepreneurs and their, their enterprises. We do this across the continent in 20 countries, but primarily focused on the Horn, the Sahel, and the Great Lakes regions of the, of the continent. And what we're seeing in terms of the, the climate and what I would say the climate conflict nexus is that is the operating environment in which most of the people that we deal with work. Their operating environment is climate stricken and conflict ridden in, in the sense of how they actually have to live on a day-to-day -day basis. So all of our solutions have to take into consideration climate as well as conflict, fragile states and, and, and frontier markets, if you will, in terms of where African enterprises, grassroots enterprises work. The areas that we focus on are directly related to some of the causes of conflict or, or that get impacted by conflict. So agriculture um, and food security off-grid energy and energy access, and then just jobs and entrepreneurship. So your slides were perfect with painting the picture of what Africans in these areas of fragile states are facing on a day-to-day, -day, and that's through conflict um, creates their fragility, but also the conflict implications. And so I think uh, Marcus was, was, was spot on that we do see drought as a major, major issue flooding as major issues there. And then the variability of when it's raining, whether it's too much or too little is really important because 70% of Africans earn their livelihoods in the agricultural sector. And so there's a phrase that says a hungry man is an angry man. Take gender and, and, and sex out of the equation, hungry people get angry, which leads to conflict. And so if climate change is impacting agriculture, it's also impacting the advent potentially of conflict. And so we've seen in areas where, where we are able to look at water um, access and solutions that that does change a lot of the opportunities for um, communities to respond but also to survive, adapt, and thrive in the face of conflict and, and climate. And so whether it's looking at the importance of irrigation. So if you think about African agriculture, it's rain fed, climate is changing. So the variability is there. Only 6% of African agriculture is under irrigation. And so, and that, that's compared to 14% in Latin America and 37% in Asia. So the lack of access to water for irrigation leads to poor food production, which leads to a lot of other challenges. And so in a country like Niger, um, that has conflict and climate intersected on the communities in a very, very, very disastrous um, way, we do look at solutions that do lead to water access. And so um, as Marcus was mentioning with aquifers and you know building dams and dams that could be used for grazing for herders, but also can be used for irrigation for, for smallholders. We looked at improved seeds and, and drought resistant, drought tolerant seeds solutions for um, African cooperatives in, in Niger. But as a specific example of where we see this really strongly in Norgian Niger, working in the Tireg region, we're working in that region and have supported ex-combatants that are coming down from Libya, post-Libya, back to Niger. 
when they're coming back as ex-combatants, they need to get reinstituted into their communities. And so what do they do? Because this is basically the desert. And so we help them to refurbish wealth that could provide water to those communities and then turn these ex-combatants into farmers. And so all of a sudden now in an area that's drought ridden, that's drought stricken, we're able to look at access to water and looking at people who had engaged in conflict, but helping reintegrate them into their communities through looking at agriculture, agricultural means. So there are some solutions out there, but we do see this across the board as, as the operating environment. It's conflict and it's climate combined for most African communities. Wow, thank you, CD. That's a really great and I think important example of what's being done in the context of those challenges and also an example of how that approach could possibly be replicated elsewhere. And what that brings to mind too is a question regarding governance and governance of these water resources. So Marcus, a question for you. Um, in terms of governance, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing and what can be done and what should be done now and by which parties and stakeholders to really address some of those transboundary water governance issues? Um, yes, yeah, so I think the first issue in terms of water governance um, is probably the idea that countries in the region, um, again, maybe using Egypt to, as an example, um, haven't really developed a culture of um, environmental um, awareness or environmental conservation. So a big piece of it is the education piece, and that's getting everybody on board within a country, be it Iraq, um, be it Egypt, to really understand that water is scarce, that we are in a water crisis, and then being able to deal with that. And so um, uh, one story I heard from a journalist um, that I know very well that was based in Cairo, um, was just about how these issues are not privileged at sort of the highest levels within the government. And he mentioned that there was a man who um, um, didn't perform well within the Ministry of Defense. Um, and he was actually put into the environmental ministry as sort of a punishment, you know, being put out to Siberia, so to speak. And so as long as um, environmental issues are viewed that way, um, then that's going to be a problem when it comes to water governance. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, another challenge I see with water governance in the region is literally just the lack of data. Um, there's something called hydro diplomacy that, um, for example, the US could be a leader in in the region, especially in shared water basins. But in order for hydro diplomacy to work, in order for sides to come together where there isn't a water regime um, a, a, of allocation of waters is really understanding how much water um, is within that system. Um, so one thing that the United States has and some of um, Europe and some other countries is we have um, an unprecedented risk of climate change and water scarcity, but we also have unprecedented foresight capabilities and unprecedented um, data gathering capabilities. So whether this is earth observation platforms like satellites, for example, um, or other technologies, we can bring these to bear um, to help um, countries that don't have as much information or as much data to implement these water policies. So a lot of times it's a data problem. And then obviously other times it's a finance problem. So countries need um, more infrastructure. They need more investment from a variety of actors, um, be that private sector, foundations, multilateral development institutions, but they really need that investment. Um, but the countries that I deal in, the countries that I do the most research in are fragile states that are really affected by conflict. So they're in an active conflict um, scenario or it's very, um, it's, it's basically um, post-conflict and re-stabilization phases. And so when there's not security, when the state is fragile, um, that is probably the largest impediment to policy implementation. You know, there's got to be a stable peace. And so bringing peace to the regions um, and helping uh, with problems on that scale gives the space and sort of the enabling environment for governments to then think more about informed water governance and policy issues and begin to think about climate adaptation as even being a goal. Right. Right. Thank you for that. And also thank you for raising the importance of the private sector. I think it's 
an important and critical issue to raise and also raises a lot of questions. I have them and also we're getting some questions from our audience about the role of finance, both including from international organizations, development banks, and the private sector. And, you know, CD, you work at the intersection of that. And I know certainly within the context of USADF, but also your work with private sector on the ground, small and medium sized enterprises. So I'd love to ask you, what role do you see the private sector playing and also with respect to finance and what kinds of projects really need financing in the region to address some of these critical challenges, particularly with respect to agriculture, agricultural supply chains and others? No, great question and, and a really important point. And I think we need to start looking at African farmers as the private sector, the African private sector. These are food suppliers to the continent and to the world in some, in some supply chains. So there's a phrase that says a farmer without a market is a gardener. So we want to make sure there are more farmers who have access to markets. And one of the biggest thing that the private sector, local private sector or international can bring is market, is market demand for goods and services that is Af African produced. I also see the private sector playing an incredible, critical, uh, incredible way and a critical way for tools and technology. So whether this is mechanization to look at greater productivity in, in agriculture, but the private sector also bringing uh, innovative tools in terms of technology. So I've worked a lot in my past at the Rockefeller Foundation and now at the US African Development Foundation in index-based weather insurance. What, what are things that we can help farmers manage their risk and also foster resilience by giving them some kind of safety nets. And so the private sector can look at tools that help smallholder farmers, those who are dependent on the land, rural ag, ag dependent people to be able to mitigate the shocks and stresses that that climate does bring. And so whether they're bringing, private sectors bringing the market as part of the market, whether it's uh, uh, financial instruments and tools like index-based weather insurance, like loan guarantees. But at the foundation, at, at the US African Development Foundation, we find the most important thing is direct support to those communities, but also that's demand-driven. A lot of solutions don't have to be developed here in Washington, DC and dropped into the Sahel or North Africa or the Great Lakes regions. There are solutions there that communities can uh, th that are communities that are facing these shocks know how to adapt to some of them. And they're looking for investment that is locally driven, that is locally owned, that really is a participatory approach, not a solution that's dropped onto the communities, but a solution that's pulled out of those communities because they are the ones uh, year on year who are facing these shocks and stressors. And they actually have some of the tools for adaptation, but we need to talk to them. We need not just about them, we need to talk to them. And we also need to invest directly in them and their ideas and in their innovative approaches to weathering the storm literally of, of climate change that they're, that they're facing. Let me quickly talk a little bit about Turkana. So Turkana is in Northern, Northern Kenya. This is the largest um, uh, desert lake in the world. And it feeds about 300,000 people in Northern Kenya. So this is an area that's drought stricken um, all the time, if you will. It used to be every 10 years. I was in, I lived in, in Kenya from 2011 to 20, the end of 2016. There were two famines and droughts during that time period, national drought emergencies by the global community and by the country. So in Turkana, you see lowering of sea levels, which is that's a huge stressor on, on the fishing environment that's there. But you also see the same thing happening with, li with, with livestock, as livestock are, are dying in, in, in numbers that are really um, dangerous for the community in terms of community cohesion and their ability to earn a livelihood. And so an intervention that we led was direct support to uh, Turkana fishermen. Um, these were beach management units and really helping those, fish those fishermen direct injection of capital. $250,000 grant to a community organization that created the beach management unit. Now they were increasing their fish, fish production methodologies, new boats, new nets, and then creating a place to market and sell the fish. Because the one thing about whether it's fish or livestock or, or um, cereals and grains, roots and tubers, any kind of agriculture, you're looking at the production, but we also need to look at the post-production and in agriculture, post-harvest. But in fishing, where are they gonna be stored? 
And if they don't have storage, you caught the fish. Now, 30 to 50% of what you caught, if you don't sell it that day, it basically gets thrown in the bush as trash. And so all of the effort that's gone into increasing production needs to be met with solutions to preserving that production. So with those same fishermen, helping them fish better in a place with lowering sea levels, in a place that's drought stricken, but providing more access to food, nutritional security, we also had to help them with post fishing management, if you will, and that was through renewable energy. So giving them solar powered refrigeration because they have the sun, solar powered refrigeration to now be able to store that fish, to smoke it. And then that literally gave them weeks on end of preservation for them to sell to new markets. And we've seen their incomes improve. We've seen them now exporting to the DRC. And when I was there um, in Turkana about six months ago, we actually saw traders from China who were buying uh, fish in Turkana to ship to ship to to um, this is Nile perch ship to to China. So you see in an area with the direct investment in a community and a community driven solution that they can combat climate change and it can lead to more community resilience so that we can help again communities survive the chronic shocks and stresses adapt to them and thrive in the face of, of constant uh, climate change. And I think Turkana is a place that is always gonna be faced with different shocks, but we need to look at locally driven solutions and, and looking at African innovation in a new way. Great, thank you, CD. And one more question before I turn to those from the audience that I have is really with respect to where we are now and how worlds have been upended really in the last several months with COVID-19 and understanding that everyone around the world is grappling with this, the impacts are exceptionally exceptionally hard for fragile states, states and the regions where you're working. So if I could just dovetail off what you were saying, CD, and then turn to you, Marcus. But CD, you're working in these communities and with these communities. So I'm wondering how are you seeing them respond right now? And and worked together to address the crises that they're facing? You know, it's been one of the um, unsung stories of COVID-19 in Africa is the level of resilience that African communities are, are showing. It, for them, this is COVID-19. It's the latest shock. It's the latest stress, but it's not going to be the last. So these are communities that are also facing in East Africa, facing a locust infestation that you know the world has never seen in, in, in that region. They're facing obviously conflict as, as was discussed earlier in terms of interconflict. Um, it abounds in a number of a number of these countries, but the community is showing tremendous resilience to adapt to the COVID challenge. So you have communities, you have conflict, you have climate, now you have COVID. So there's a lot of seas happening in, in these communities. And what we're seeing is them be able to adapt some of their, their solutions and business models in the face of, of COVID-19. So one of the early things in terms of the health challenge, not necessarily the economic challenge, but the health challenge is that they need access to literally soap and water. And so we see shea nut, shea butter producers, palm oil producers who are producing for external markets that are now um, shut down, if you will, now turning into uh, turning into soap producers. So they're producing soap and making it available for their community members to be able to uh, actually wash their hands at a more frequent basis. We see irrigation um, grantees and enterprises and entrepreneurs that we funded around water and water access, creating hand washing stations in those same communities. So the level of resilience and adaptation, not only to climate change, but to this new shock we're seeing in communities is actually remarkable. We're seeing groups that we've funded in off-grid energy that, that are doing mini grids, that were providing household um, energy solutions for communities, or also we're powering local small and medium-sized enterprises, now taking their renewable energy solutions in solar and wind and hydro and linking them to rural health clinics. So those rural health clinics now are operating on a 24-hour cycle isolation centers in Nigeria now that are linked with um, renewable energy African enterprises. And so we're seeing a level of resilience and community cohesion that is really remarkable. And it's one of the unsung stories on how African communities are, are, are it's unfortunate, but are used to having to adapt to 
some stressors and shocks and COVID is the latest, it won't be the last, but we're seeing communities really step up to the challenge on the preventive measures, but also looking at how they're gonna recover and build their resilience so that they can bounce back better after the initial wave for this global pandemic subsides. So we've been really impressed with, with the, um, the local solutions that are coming to us for funding and we're providing relief capital initially, but we are looking at funding to restructure some of our organizations and enterprises and grantees, some of their solutions so that they can be responsive, again, to grow in the face of COVID. So technology solutions, digitization, a lot of things that are being asked for are helping African communities um, respond to COVID. But it is, it is an, a daunting challenge, but communities are stepping up. Thanks, CD, and thanks for those concrete examples. I think they're they're really informative, and I think there's a lot we can all learn from them. Um, relatedly, Marcus, I'd like to turn to you quickly before turning to the audience. You know, in the midst of COVID nineteen, climate, which is obviously an urgent crisis, and I think a lot of climate change related security issues also may be put aside or at least delayed. I mean, we've seen the COP twenty six. Um, plans delayed until next year. And so given that and given the current climate, what do you think need to be priorities for governments, the defense community and planners right now so that these very much interconnected and linked issues related to climate and security and COVID are front of mind and that interconnected planning can happen now? Yeah, so um, I've been thinking about this recently, and um, what I'm thinking is, what is the struggle of the United States, um, China, other countries that are most stricken by COVID? Um, what what does their struggle to really deal with the problem, contain the problem, say about um, our response to climate change, to the climate crisis? Um, so there's some parallelisms between the two crises that are, are very vivid and evident. I mean, each one involves the whole world. Um, no one person can self-isolate um, either from COVID or um, from climate change's impacts. Um, we can try, um, but, but in the end, it affects each of us. Um, we must address both problems in solidarity. So it's an international, it's a transnational security problem. Um, but what's also at the very center of this is science. It's predicting risk, either for climate change or for COVID. So that's really um, the, the nexus there, I think, between the two issues. Um, and so the question I have, um, and, and I don't think it's played itself out yet, is really how much do we trust science? So if we trust science in order to um, solve the, the um, come up with a vaccine, for example, if we trust science about staying at home, following best practices, um, then that says a lot about, I hope, an increasing understanding in, within the um, public of um, really understanding, listening to, and following the recommendations of scientists. So I hope this is a global trend. Um, and I hope that this trend is reinforced um, by COVID. Um, but, my, but quickly to mention, you know, defense institutions, security institutions, um, what they do is they plan for the worst outcomes, right? Um, so I think we can learn some lessons there um, in terms of predictive analysis um, playing out in, in war games or, or peace games, just like, um, you, you know, your organization had done. Um, but I think the key is, first of all, science. And then it's building the predictive capabilities, both for um, monitoring climate crises and for monitoring the COVID crises. So it's getting out in front of the questions, it's predictive um, capabilities, and it's building surveillance. Um, what, obviously, um, you know, the CDC could play a role in that. Um, the, the World Health Organization. So it's really putting money behind predicting early warning um, and understanding where there's going to be the worst impacts of climate change. And that's very um, close to the same sort of methodology, the same sort of thinking um, for understanding and predicting outbreaks of COVID. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for that dialogue and the conversation. I'm going to now turn to some of the questions that we've been receiving from the audience. Um, 
And this to go, could go to both of you. Um, this is from Tom Russo from the Elliott School. Um, is a grand Ethiopian Renaissance dam an example of weaponizing water or could it mitigate security in the region? Um, Marcus, do you wanna jump in there? Right, so the um, Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, um, you know, um, well, one thing you mentioned actually during the your slides was that Egypt um, gets, you know, a total of 96% of its water from outside its borders and something like 70% um, from Ethiopia. So the, the real question there is what is the attitude of Ethiopia as they fill the dam? It's not filled yet. Um, but it is considered, you know, a really vital security risk to the to the Egyptians at this point. So there's still room for negotiation, but there is sort of an unambiguous um, condition that Ethiopia does now have some additional leverage um, in the region, some additional leverage over um, Egypt, for example. Um, Sudan stands to benefit, so they're increasing their um, amount of arid. Um, I mean, the amount of land that can be cultivated. So it, it affects different countries in different ways. So I wouldn't call it um, intentional weaponization, but it's the idea that of something called hydro hegemony, where upstream states gain leverage um, over states that are downstream. Um, but one thing is, I think that the Egyptians have, um, have privileged this and prioritized this as sort of a security threat. So the Egyptians are in the mindset that maybe this is an aggressive posture by Ethiopia, whereas Ethiopia has, you know, what they see as legitimate development needs, um, the, the needs to increase electricity for a growing population. So I think what we need to do um, is get out of the frame of mind um, that this was intentional weaponization of water and just realize that there's a regional picture here um, for development and try to promote more negotiations among the parties to the Nile um, and not think of it in those um, sort of stark terms that say the Egyptians are at this point. Okay, thank you for that. Um, a separate question related to technology. Um, and I'd like to direct this one to you, CD. It's coming from Professor Herbert Rengenbogen at the Catholic University of America. Um, Israel, he says, has hydro technology. And could you explain how this technology next door might help alleviate enormous water conservation on scale? Um, or I think instead of alleviate enormous water conservation or enable conservation. Um, with respect to either Israel's technology or just technology more broadly, what role do you see technology playing in this, in this area and with these issues? It's, cri it's critical. Technology is, is one of, of the question around private sector. How can the private sector play a role? Look at, look at Africa um, as an opportunity to provide solutions. There are obviously South-South collaboration. There's a number of things that technology can do all along, whether it's the agricultural supply chain, whether that's in rural areas, in areas of, of conflict. And we see digitization playing a key role in linking markets. During times of flood, you, you see um, roads being impassable for weeks and months on end. So the production is on one, one end of, of, of the road and the actual buyers on the other end and they can't meet, can't connect, don't, um, can't confirm any of the shipment for you know weeks and months on end. But with, through digital technology, we've been able to link um, buyers and, and sellers of produce and production um, in ways that were previously imp impossible without technology. I think a lot of the um, the solutions in, particularly in Israel, because it's a a country that is um, you know essentially in the desert, um, if you will, and they've been able to look at um, drip irrigation. So solutions like drip irrigation um, it, or have been really transformational for uh, African agriculture and African climate change resilience building. And so I think the role of technology is, is critical and there should be more collaboration and coordination between African governments and African communities with technology providers to look at scaling um, some of the solutions across the continent. Great. Actually, that's related to a question we just got from Alan Norman, which was about how to best promote water efficient food production. 
your comments on drip irrigation, I think are directly to that point. Um, he also notes that changing the species that are traditional or currently most marketable, marketable may also be may also be needed. That that's exactly right. I think there's we've seen we've seen itch issues in uh, instances in Burkina Faso with something like cotton, and we've seen cotton producers um, shift because of climate change and because of market changes shift from cotton producers to growing sesame. Um, and so there's, there are some shifts in production to adapt to climate change in terms of crop choices that we, we've, we've supported and seen. And the same thing, lastly, I'll say around, around shifting mindsets and potentially opportunities is look at the herder pastor, the herder farmer crisis that we see happening in many countries, but particularly Nigeria has a lot to do obviously with resource um, scarcity, but things like grazing land, like ranches, I mean, trying to have pastoralists adopt new, let's say, practices, if you will, uh, organizational practices to um, respond to the challenge that, you know, open grazing causes for farmers, if you will. And so there, there are things that I think um, ad adaptation models and adoption models that can help with some of the climate induced um, challenges that pastoralists face, but also that farmers face as well. Okay, great, thank you. I have one other question, and we're unfortunately running short on time, but one other question from Matt Wald at the Nuclear Energy Institute, and this is for you, Dr. King. Um, this is in regard to desalination plants. I know that's something that you've worked quite a bit on. Um, and the question is, is burning natural gas to run desalination plants a good way to stabilize the climate? So, um... Natural gas has, you know, been referred to as a bridge fuel um, because it is cleaner than coal. It's cleaner than burning oil, um, but it's obviously not as clean as um, renewable energy or in this case, as Matt was referring to, um, nuclear energy. Um, so what we've seen is in, for example, in the Gulf, um, the Persian Gulf, there's been um, the, the, the um, the, the you know the Gulf monarchies have been looking at adopting um, nuclear energy to get that baseload power that will power the desal plants, and so um, that's obviously the cleanest um, alternative from a climate mitigation standpoint. Um, but we also have to think about um, nuclear power and understand that there are some attendant security risks. Um, there is a downside when it comes to um, disposal of fuel. Um, so we just have to make sure that when we do have nuclear power um, powering desalinization plants, that we're doing so in areas that are political sta politically stable and will remain secure, um, that we're doing it in areas that have the grid infrastructure to support the very heavy loads of nuclear power. Um, and we're doing it um, in countries that really can um, afford that investment. So when it comes down to it, um, you know, and also I just wanted to mention that there are now smaller nuclear reactors um, that, that have a, a megawattage that is more aligned with the power needs of a smaller desalinization plant. So there have been some very um, important technological advances with nuclear power that makes it more appropriate in terms of size and scale for desalinization. But there is always going to be some attendant security risks with nuclear power. So we want these countries that have the, the capacity to deal with that. And then hopefully the safety culture that, that's inculcated in order to do this safely. Great. Um, I said that was gonna be the last one, but I have one more. Um, this is from Jack Stewart. Uh, he's a research associate with the Environmental Security Program at the Stimson Center. And this is to both of you. I know you have you both have perspectives on this issue. Um, he says the link between climate and security is often talked about at the state to state level, but we're seeing more non-state actors such as Boko Haram, which we mentioned, and Marcus, I know that's been a lot of your research and Boko Haram and ISIS weaponize water resources um, for strategic ends. And could either of you speak to how we should discuss the link between climate and security at the non-state actor level? I'll, I'll let Marcus, because this is his, his, uh, his specialty, you know, tackle it. But I would, I would just say that, that that question is is spot on, that in this times of COVID and, and climate change, we do see non-state actors um, expand a lot of the nefarious uh, activities that and take advantage of, of 
the communities and the situation for, for um, means that aren't supportive at all. And so we look at the realities around economic development, around directly supporting communities, around giving them a voice and a choice in their own development and sort of really providing direct support to them as a way to combat um, some of the, the, the things that non-state actors would do. And this is even in job creation in places like Somalia, um, where investing in young people and helping them create jobs and link them to job placement has been a direct um, counter to Al-Shabaab recruitment. And Al-Shabaab would typically recruit a young person for the promise of $50 a month and a cell phone. And that young person would put on a suicide um, uh, vest and walk into a mall in, in Nairobi, if you will. And now because of work that we're doing on job creation in a place that's drought stricken and famine stricken um, on numerous occasions in Somalia, we're now supporting young people to create jobs and establish jobs and are earning $300 a month. And they have a clear alternative to some of the recruitment efforts, efforts of non-state actors that are taking advantage of climate change and, and, and conflict times to recruit um, for terrorist, terrorist activities. I think that's right. And so the um, non-state actors that I've really concentrated on um, looking at are violent extremist organizations. Um, and so these violent extremist organizations are very difficult to deal with. Um, if we had the answer to terrorism um, and those um, you know, techniques, we, we'd be a lot further than we are at this point. Um, but I do think it requires all the levers of foreign policy. So those levers are defense, development, and diplomacy. Um, again, non-state actors are particularly challenging because they don't see themselves as limited by the rules of war. Um, they don't adhere to the Geneva Conventions or the Environmental Modification Treaty. Um, but one thing we can do, I believe, is is um, implement sanctions against countries that sponsor groups that use water as a weapon, for example. Um, an example could be the Houthis in Yemen um, who are sponsored in, in some ways by Iran. Um, but also it's the idea that it's of development. We have to um, stop these subnational actors from gaining legitimacy um, by providing water and municipal services um, to the people. So this is gonna be really sort of a counterinsurgency strategy and conflict avoidance, but through development. So it's eliminating the water insecurity um, that then enables these groups to, um, to, to get the leverage over water. So the more, the less scarce water is, um, the less it can be weaponized. Um, and then finally, from a defense standpoint, we just have to understand and implement counterinsurgency strategies that um, get to the water infrastructure in time um, that provide water infrastructure through things like um, military cooperation um, and understand again that we don't want these subnational actors or these extremist organizations um, to be able to monopolize water or, or weaponize it. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for the questions from our audience and thank you both of you for joining us. Um, fortunately, we're out of time for today, but again, a huge thanks to all of you and also to our partners for supporting the research and the simulations and the peace games that fed the research. Um, also like to thank our team who's been working on this and also notably my colleague is Isabel Schmidt who's done a tremendous amount of work on this. So to all of you out there, the recording of this event will be available shortly um, and the full report is on our website at foreignpolicy.com, climate and security and also stay tuned for more research and actionable insights for subscribers to FP Insider, um, which is FP subscription for users, including upcoming power maps on data governance and other issues. Um, so visit foreignpolicy.com slash FP Insider to learn more about that tier of subscription. And also I'd really like to draw everyone's attention to just foreignpolicy.com and the expanding coverage on coronavirus and other news of the day. Um, but before I go, I guess it's Earth Day, um, I'd be remiss not to mention um, the podcast that was recently launched as well by FP Studios in collaboration with the Climate Investment Funds. It's called Heat of the Moment, it's fabulous, and it's also available on the website um, at foreignpolicy.com slash podcasts. 
So if you're looking for some good news about how people are instituting concrete climate action and transformational projects, you can find it there. Thanks everyone for joining us again today. We appreciate it. Stay safe and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.